started this channel to record every book I read, and with a few notable omissions, I've achieved that. But in the last six months, I haven't made a video, but I have read like a load of books, and there have been droughts on this channel in the past, yes, but those are just because I haven't been reading. Now I just haven't been making videos, kind of because I moved house and there's no good place to film and I have a super loud road. Also, I'm starting a business, link down below, really cute jewellery. Uh, but I didn't want it to go away, so basically we're going to review everything I've read in the past six months. This is 28 books. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna timestamp and link everything below. So instead of watching however long this ends up being, you can jump to things that you might actually be interested in, or you can just enjoy my lovely personality. Let's start at the start. The first book I read as an audiobook was The Northern Lights by Philip Pullman. This is an odd elbow thing. Philip Pullman trilogy. Northern Lights is the first book of the His Dark Materials trilogy by Philip Pullman. It's like a childhood classic, everyone read it as a kid, I didn't, so I listened to the audiobook when I was driving home one time. It didn't overly thrill me, I'm not going to actively read the rest of them. That was easy. After that I listened to the entire works of Sherlock Holmes again. Uh, I made a video about that last year, I will link it below. The Little Friend by Donna Tart. This is Donna Tart's middle book, so the Secret History came out in 92, I think this came out in 2002, and The Goldfinch came out in 2014. Middle Child, least loved, uh, but since I, The Secret History is one of my favourite books and I really like Goldfinch, I was like, I need to complete this, so I read The Little Friend. It's about a 12 year old girl called Harriet and her friend Healy um, as they go off in the little Mississippi town to try and solve the mystery of Harriet's brother, Robin, who was like hung outside of their home when he was nine, uh, when Harriet was a baby. So yeah, it's a very dark book, like it's about very adult things but told through the eyes of children, which feels kind of wrong, um, at, but it's yeah, it's very sort of like eerie and mysterious. The one thing that I found really weird about it, honestly, is I have this sort of dissociation with the, with the setting. It's a little town in Mississippi, yes, I understand that, sort of, but I can't, you know, I've never been there. I've been to like Florida, but like I can't imagine sort of like the size of the houses or the streets or the kind of vibe of a town. And every time I've tried to, I felt like I was sort of like fighting against the book somehow and ended up just really sort of frustrating me. The Goldfinch is set mostly in New York City and The Secret History is set in this like fake liberal arts college in New Hampshire. Um, New Hampshire? Do I mean that? Yeah. And they're just a lot more compelling as locations for me personally than this. Um, but you know, it was a good, good read. Next book I read was Autumn by Ali Smith. I hadn't read any Ali Smith before. I think I had one of her books, but yeah, this was the first one. I just kind of saw it one day and I was like, you know what, I want to read that. I so rarely read contemporary British literature. It's so wonderfully familiar to me that I feel like I'm automatically going to enjoy it. This is also quite a quiet book, which I really like. It's more sort of like slow and contemplative. Um, and that's just exactly what I, what I wanted. So it's about um, this old man called Daniel and his relationship with this girl called Elizabeth, who is like in her 20s, 30s, just kind of struggling a bit through life. And it's like, sort of about Brexit. The prose was lovely and joyful and I would really recommend it. I also very much want to read Winter but it's still only in hardback and I just refuse to buy it in hardback so I'm gonna wait until I guess like Christmas to actually get it in paperback. And then it was December, I did had a lot of like manual physical work to do in December which lends itself really well to audiobooks so I started re-listening to Dracula again which I read like the month before which was in my last big review video, uh, I will link to that. And then I listened to Mythos by Stephen Fry, which is a retelling of some Greek myths. It came out around that time, I think. It came out like October, November, December, I don't know. I really enjoyed the retelling. I thought it was like lighthearted and entertaining and he did a really good job at weaving the stories together. Um, but also one thing he did was he just like made all these linguistic links of like this word now is because of this Greek goddess blah blah blah. They're really good to like drop into conversations at dinner parties. Obviously in a not too long book he's not gonna get every myth in and he doesn't at all. They're not even like the popular choices, they're just quite an interesting range. So I'm really hoping that Stephen Fry does a sequel. Like chances are pretty high hopefully. Okay the next audio books were the Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear by Patrick Rothfuss. These are the first two books in the King Keller Chronicles. The third book is like hopefully gonna be released at some point in the next decade. Uh, these were just exceptional. I absolutely love them. It's this classic 
like epic fantasy surrounding this guy called Quoth. Um, and all of the tales are kind of told from when he's a bit older, like in retrospect about like him growing up. So it starts out with him in this um, like traveling troupe called the Edema Maru, which are like murder, everyone's murdered basically apart from him uh, by the Chandrian. Um, and then he goes off and he's like in poverty in this town and then he eventually like uh, goes to this university and manages to get in with all of his wit and cunning. Um, and he has this lyre, which is like the only thing he has from his dad and he learns how to play the lyre really well. Do I mean lyre? Do I mean loot? I feel like it's liar. It's just like action and fantasy and magic and it's like everything, it's so good, so good. <laughs> it's one of those fantasies that's really well fleshed out but also makes you aware of like the vastness of stuff you don't know, like there's so much more to explore. If you've never heard anyone talk about this, just take my word for it, but if you have, you'll know that like they loved it as well. I don't think I've ever encountered someone or like anything that didn't think that this was just brilliant. Super high recommendation, will be listening to again. I might buy the actual novels but I know that the second one is like 900 pages long or something ridiculous, so maybe audiobooks are the way to go. And then Christmas happened and then I didn't do any reading in January, but I got back into it with something tiny, which is Shoplifting for American Apparel by Tao Lin. This is just a little novella. I read his only novel, Taipei, a few years ago. I wrote, made a review of it, so I will link that below. And um, it's basically more of the same stuff. It's just despondent 20-somethings living in Manhattan mysteriously surviving without making any money. I found Taipei to be sort of like on the edge of pretension and this is very much like teetering on that line as well. I found it like yeah very pretentious but um no sorry no there's no redeeming factors. <laughs> this is just um it lacked a lot of the charm of Taipei. It was just like a bit felt a bit pointless so not fantastic, but I will continue to follow his work because I'm really intrigued by the style. Next book I read, I read on my Kindle because I hate the US cover and the US cover is so nice, but also if I bought the US edition, it wouldn't be the right size for my bookshelves. This is a like ongoing struggle I have with a lot of books. This is Sourdough by Robin Sloan. Back in February, whenever I read this, um, I got back in contact with an ex who I hadn't spoken to in like two and a half years. And one of the first things he said to me is, have you read Sourdough? It's literally about you. And having read it, I don't think it's about me, uh, but I'm taking that as a compliment because the main character, Lois, she has this sort of like self-assuredness um, and determination. And she also has this like yearning for like physical satisfaction, like making things that I definitely have as well. Um, so I can see the comparison. But yeah, it's not about me. <laughs> so this Saudo is about this woman called Lois who is a software engineer in San Francisco. And one day her favorite like local sandwich shop closes down and the owner gives her this sourdough starter and is like, you should make bread. So she starts making bread and then she just like can't stop making bread. But also this starter is like much more than just like a yeast thing. It's like alive. She has like a relationship with it in a in a nice way, in like a slightly mystical way. The thing that I loved about this book was how just like weirdly fantastical it was. Like from the, f the first page is like a map of San Francisco, which is like Lois's world, which is all of the locations in the book. And there are just like random little mentions of like, oh, she jumped like an elf. And they're just like little, little things that make it just, just like, weirdly enchanting like she's part of this thing called the Lois Club which is just like a club for people called Lois it's very uplifting and like heartwarming in that sort of serendipitous way you know this this like a man gives her this sage gift that like teaches her about like herself and her relationship with food and also like what she wants to do with her job and it's just like it's just a very nice book the next book I have is Homage to Catalonia by George Orwell this is about his experiences in the Spanish Civil War in the 30s, which I honestly didn't know anything about before I read this. So historically, I feel enlightened. Orwell sort of an ideologue and just goes to fight with the militia in this war. Um, and it's a lot about just sort of like trench warfare and stuff, which just doesn't interest me. I just don't care. Um, but I did find it interesting to see the kind of relationships between the different like factions of the militia and also to see like when they're they're back in Barcelona um, but the war is still happening and to try and see like this sort of urban environment keep going but also like being in a state of war was really interesting because I didn't understand how that sort of 
happened. Also, you're never going to go wrong with George Orwell's writing style. Absolutely love that. So, good book. Next book I have is Eat Up by Ruby Tando of Great British Bake Off and just general awesomeness fame. This is one of those books that I couldn't shut up about for weeks. It wasn't like I wanted, you know, and sometimes you're like, I want everyone to read this book. I don't want everyone to read this book. It's not for everybody, but I wanted everyone to get like the sentiment out of it. I wanted everyone to get what I got out of it. And what I got out of it is threefold. The first thing is that like healthy eating itself is a fad. Like I never really, I just internalize so many of my views about what what foods are like good and what are bad. Um, and I don't really let that affect what I eat, but I do massively let that affect like how I feel about what I eat. And it's one of those things where like, she just puts forth this, this, this thesis about how like, we're all sort of brainwashed into thinking these things. We've all, we've all evolved to the point of being like fad diets are bad, but actually like now this sort of like wellness eating is still a fad diet. It's just not labeled as such in the same way that like religions are cults. And this book is also like very well researched, like specifically she addresses like studies and there's a good bibliography in the back for all of those statistics also i just trust ruby tando on food like i really just believe that she wants the best for me and my body the second thing i learned from this these are all the same thing basically is that nourishment can come from anywhere like she just doesn't discriminate between like having like a dirty chicken and chips or like a shitty like take out curry with like a really fancy meal that she's spent ages preparing and you know has a lot of like vegetables blah 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 she's like these sometimes you just need a mcdonald's and that is actually what's best for you at that time because that's what your body's that's what your body wants i know a lot of people would be like if i had what i wanted to have all the time i'd be like stupidly fat um i don't think that's true for me personally like i think i'm i'm fairly good at self-regulating what i want but i do just have a massive sort of like guilt attached to like oh i shouldn't be having this mcdonald's even if i'm gonna like do it anyway but she's just like no like if if your body is telling you that you need like some marmite on toast like have some marmite on toast like it's not gonna kill you and like additionally all of these things that we've been taught to label as like good and bad things it's so much more complicated than that it, to the extent of like you can never really know or know exactly what you need at any given time your body's pretty adaptable like it'll use what food you give it and the third thing is that enjoyment of your food is the most important thing there are some really beautiful passages in this book about like unwrapping cream eggs you know and just making like food a ceremony like making it an event and enjoying like the taste and the feeling of of eating you know and of like replenishing yourself it's verging on spiritual but in like a very just very like connected way like i really appreciated that and like obviously sometimes if you're like going out to a really nice restaurant or you've like spent ages cooking something you're gonna really enjoy it but like i can enjoy my marmite on toast with the same amount of reverence and i'm going to <laughs> this book is also like sprinkled with little recipes which is really sweet and just like stories from her life and her family um and i really enjoyed this if you like care about ruby tando at all or like want to maybe think differently about like your appetite and your relationship with food i really really recommend this one next book i have is only dull people a brilliant at breakfast by oscar wilde this is just like a collection of witticisms by oscar wilde in one of the little um little black classics things uh and yeah they're very um some of them are really on point and then some of them are just him trying to be contrarian and it's just so oscar wilde and i wanted to bring this up because um there's this podcast called the dead authors podcast it ended a few years ago but it was by um upright citizens brigade in la and it was where it was like hg wells had a time machine <laughs> and it's fictional hg wells traveling back in time to interview other authors but they're both just like comedians messing around so they have this one episode about oscar wilde and it just is so funny <laughs> so whenever i think of oscar wilde now i think oscar wild because that's how he says it in this podcast episode it's very funny i'll link that below book number 14 halfway through guys is american gods by neil gaiman i listened to this as an audiobook after my boyfriend recommended it extremely strongly um but i was also working on very frustrating i was like doing a lot of finishing of jewelry and it was like a really annoying batch so like my memory of listening to this book is being annoyed at work which is not a very good association also i was listening to the 10th anniversary edition which is a lot more like the original manuscript than the one edited down for the first edition so um neil gaiman himself has said like there's just there's a lot more sort of filler in here uh which i kind of felt like it did feel like it dragged on in areas that was unnecessary but i'm sure if you got the 
non-tenth anniversary edition, a lot of that would be cut out. It's a big book. Like it's the kind of book and kind of world that like has so much context that you kind of assume that it would be a series. It's set on the premise that if you believe, if p enough people believe in something, it becomes real in terms of like gods so there are like old gods and then there are like new gods um that's a really bad description so like old gods of like norse gods and then new gods of like electronics but they're all like anthropomorphized as like actual mortal humans in the world which is well i guess they're not mortal they're probably immortal but um yeah it's, it's, it's like a strange like that premise doesn't really sound like it would lend itself to like a very kind of dark gritty book um, but it does. So it kind of follows this guy called Shadow who's just got out of prison, he's just found out his wife has died in a car accident um, and he sort of gets taken in by this man called Wednesday um, to do some unspecified work for him and it sort of goes from there. Didn't particularly care for the main character although I'm not sure if that was the narration that put me off it. Um, but overall it was like a really good book. It was weird like but in all of the good ways we have made it to halfway through this list of books are you enjoying this i am loving it number 15 is also an audiobook i listened to this in one day and like half of it i was just sitting in this chair in the dark listening to it which i never do with audiobooks so it's a testament to its quality it is so you've been publicly shamed by john ronson john ronson is a journalist and the book sort of starts out with an exploration of like what and why is public shaming like how does it happen and what are the repercussions of it and what's right about it and what's wrong about it and he does that through uh like several different stories um of people encountering public shaming i found this very very strange to listen to because i'm not gonna go too much into it but like i was involved in like a, a, a big public shaming thing um that was actually maybe gonna be in this book and it was like reliving that entire situation and i kind of like I knew I wanted to uh, like maybe go through it and process it again and I knew that to do that it would be through this book. Um, it just kind of like felt like it was the right time and it was very cathartic and it's a, it is just like an exceptional book um, but I kind of like finished it being like I'm so glad that he has kind of brought to light the, the tiny percentage of what it feels like on the other side of public shaming so that people can actually maybe start to understand like the larger repercussions of it. I kind of thought that by the end I might just be kind of revolted by it and hate it but actually I finished with just a very positive feeling. I really enjoyed it, would definitely recommend. Next I read some of these tiny penguin modern things. This was food by Gertrude Stein. It was absolute trash. Throw it away. I'm all for some abstract verse i thought it might be like evocative descriptions like anita but no it was just like absolute nonsense absolute nonsense next i read the breakthrough by daphne du maurier this takes place in like the english countryside somewhere and is about a like government testing facility and it's kind of like paranormal and eerie and mysterious without actually like being really any of it like it's not it doesn't if you like actually read it it's not very mysterious but it just like invokes in you this feeling of eeriness which is quite weird um like a little bit boring but like i liked it and then we have the distance to the moon by italo calvino oh, be still my heart um this has been the ex i was talking about earlier who recommended sourdough to me um he was always like calvino was his favorite writer and he was like you will love calvino you've got to read some of him and i kind of like i understood that he was being like genuine about it like i knew i would really enjoy it um but i just didn't and i kind of wanted to i've kind of been like vaguely saving him um and this so this was the first calvino i've ever read and oh it's just spectacularly enchanting so so wonderful this is a few short stories it starts with the distance to the moon um which is i don't even want to tell you what it's about he manages to make stuff so strange like they're all very like bizarre and creative but they don't feel unsettling like it's not delivered to you in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable it all feels very like safe even if it's really weird i just absolutely love this like please do do like find this short story and if you have read a lot of calvino tell me what i should read next because i don't know i'm thinking invisible cities but i don't i don't know i don't know 
like which path is gonna make me the happiest. So <laughs> next we have We Have Always Lived in the Castle by Shirley Jackson. I really love this um this coffee. It's one of those uh oh yeah, penguin orange collection. So it's got like deckled edges which is kind of a change, but it has these nice little flaps. Um and I just love the illustrations on the front, how they've changed the um like classic design and that. It's really nice. So I hadn't read any Shirley Jackson until the start of this year where I got her um the lottery and other stories, which has been on my bedside table because I read, I think I've read about three quarters of it. It's been on my bedside table literally this whole year, but I don't remember which stories I haven't read at this point, so I can't really mark it off as read, but I need to go through it again. Anyway, I sort of read that and I was like, oh, it just feels like, it's a really nice callback. I really like the this, the time period um, and the way she talks about it in a, it's, it's very kind of light and whimsical to me, even if it is like actually a historical period. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, so this is about um, a family <laughs> and it's narrated by this girl called Mary Catherine and her she lives with her sister Constantine so she's like 18 or something her sister Constantine is a few years older than her and their uncle Julian who is like wheelchair bound in this gorgeous old house and we find out pretty early on that what happened is that six years ago all of the rest of their family died in a dinner party and Constance um, was accused of murder and later acquitted, but it just kind of left them being really insular and just blocked out by the rest of society. I still can't really tell if I actually liked it. I hated the narrator. I hated, I hated the narrator from the very start. I know you're kind of supposed to like not like her, but I feel like I just was immediately hated her. <laughs> One thing I liked a lot about this book though, is its descriptions of like the decay of the house. In the same way, one of my favorite books, The Virgin Suicides, has a very similar thing of like, it's a family sort of becoming more sort of insular and internalized and that's reflected in the house that they live in but it also seems so irrevertible like this decay has one direction only it's only gonna get like you can't claw back from that and it's sort of melancholy um but it's also very kind of intriguing it makes you sort of lean in a little bit um yeah, I love that. I love that element of it. And it was well written. Um, and I quite, I like the setting. I just, I just hated the main characters so much. <laughs> Next we have The Chrysalids by John Wyndham. I think this is the fourth Wyndham book I've read. And it's really different. I didn't know, honestly, I didn't really know anything going into this. I was like, it's a Wyndham. I'm going to love it. Um, but all of the other Wyndham books I've read have been set sort of like in England with like a nice couple in the 1950s or whatever. This is not that at all. This is like a post-apocalyptic, I think, Canada, um, where essentially like a lot of genetic mutation has happened. And to counterbalance that, um, like religion is very serious. So there's like a lot of kind of sanctions on uh, like what is allowed and what isn't allowed. So if you have any sort of like deformity, um, then you just basically get like killed at birth. So it's about this boy David who is the son of one of the most important people in this town. Also the, the, they're all sort of like feudal type stuff, like it's going back to horse and cart era um, because they've lost all the technology in the future but they knew it had happened. Um, so yeah it's about this boy David uh, who has a mutation that no one knows about and he knows a couple other people that have the same sort of thing. So the book is kind of an adventure of them hiding but then also sort of escaping. It kind of feels like the bit at the start of The Two Towers, you know where like Merry and Pippin are like lost and like Legolas and Aragorn and Gimli are like chasing after them. It's just that sort of like running through woods type feeling. <laughs> <laughs> That's a terrible description. Um, I really liked it. It felt like it was very jarring at the start for it to be so unfamiliar to what I expected. Um, but it was it was great. It held together fantastically. Imagine the Scarlet Letter crossed with Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation. Like that's a pretty that's a pretty accurate combination. <laughs> Next book I have I actually listened to as an audiobook, but then I went out and bought a physical copy because I was like I'm gonna wanna reread this. Um, but then I immediately lent it to a friend. So this is just here as a like ceremonial stand-in. This is Sapiens, A Brief History of Humankind by Yuval Noah Harari. It came out in this year um, and I feel like it's only getting more popular. You know, it's one of those books that I feel like I'm seeing more and more. Maybe it's just because I read it and then you have that thing where you see it everywhere. But it's one of those like lasting non-fiction works, I think. So it's basically about everything over all time. I don't know how he manages to fit so much in without it being overwhelming and also just also carrying a lot of nuance. So it is like 
history, politics, anthropology, sociology, it's a macro history of the world and of humans' place inside of that. But as I say, it's not overwhelming, it's very like conversational, it's very, it doesn't patronise you in any way. Um, it's just very, very good. <laughs> I feel like before I read this book, I was like here, right? About thinking about humanity. And now I'm sort of here. So I still have mostly the same views, but I feel like I have a lot of more context for firstly why I think those things and also like why those things, like how those things have been affected by like the development of people in the last couple of like decades and centuries. A couple of things that like blew my mind. Um, did we domesticate corn or did corn domesticate us? Because like we formed agricultural societies around the fact that we could control control um, the food that we were creating, but really it was like the restrictions that that food had in us domesticating it that forced us into becoming agricultural societies. What? Also it's talking about how like the way modern society works is by us, us like collectively agreeing that things exist where like in the past there were basically humans like we had opinions and like only other people had opinions but now we have like we accept that like corporations and countries are like things that are just like things but they're just they're just not they're, like we we made a line on the map i know this is obvious and these are all things i knew already but it just sort of like frames it in a way that you're like fuck like, you didn't think about it that way also from a historical perspective i didn't realize that like Empires are the only thing that kind of advanced us, like without like slavery and war and like a vast difference between um, like the people on top and the people at the bottom. Like that's how we came up with all of our inventions were like through trade routes and just like empire. Oh, it just sort of blew my mind. Really great book. Strong thumbs up. And yeah, kids, you guess right. I immediately picked up the sequel, which I also read as an audiobook and then just bought a copy of. It was cheap, okay? It was like two freight pounds, shut up. So Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari is a brief history of tomorrow as opposed to history of humankind. So like, Sapiens was looking back, this is looking forward. Um, there is like a decent amount of crossover, like it's definitely still valuable, but I wouldn't recommend reading them back to back. Like that, I feel like they'd be a lot more valuable if you had like a couple months or like years, whatever, between them. This was really expanding on the last couple chapters of Sapiens, where he was talking about humanism um, as like, we've all sort of started to think that we deserve like self actualization. <laughs> like we all kind of prioritize humans and human needs um, and human superiority over anything else in the world, um, rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly. Historically speaking, this is a relatively new belief, but it is so strong now um, that it is going to be what carries us into the next couple of centuries. Um, so this is talking about how humans have their main like goal at the moment is to increase longevity, lifespan, and happiness. That's like all we really want to do. It does go a bit into like productivity and stuff like that, um, but yeah, primarily it's about like how we are going to use technology um, to become, and how we've already exported a lot of our sort of like internal algorithms to um, computers, etc., and how we're going to use all of that to become gods. Um, but also how like in the eyes of our ancestors, we are already gods. Like we are doing things that people hundreds of years ago, let alone thousands of years ago, couldn't believe would exist, um, and. It's a lot about sort of like the arrogance of humanity, but also how there's no like real counterbalance to that. Like there's, there's not like, you know, a different dominant species telling us off for it. Um, anyway, sorry, this is <laughs> me being very vague. I didn't enjoy this quite as much as Sapiens because I feel like I got a lot out of Sapiens in terms of just like historical knowledge and context. And this is more sort of speculative future science fictions, but it was also sort of, it feels like it's really written for a mass market, which is fair enough, like it's supposed to be, Sapiens definitely was. Um, and I think I have like a lot, I thought a lot more about the contents of this book, so it felt, some of it felt a little bit surface level. Um, it was good though, would recommend, definitely. Next book I have is The Road by Cormac McCarthy. How have I never read this before? I don't know, it was about time. I want to say this came out in 2007, but I'm a check. 2006, god damn it. Okay, so it came out in 2006. <laughs> 
Um, it is about a, it's set in North America, I believe. It's about a post-apocalyptic world in which like everything has been burnt. So there's just like no way of producing food. There's no way of going back to how life was. Um, and because there's no way of producing food, like the more time that passed, the more scarce the resources are, the fewer people are around and the more they'll do to stay around. So it's people living off canned food, but like no one's making any more canned food. It follows a man and his son, man and boy, never named, um, as they travel further south, hopefully to find some sort of paradise, but really just to find a slightly warmer space. Um, and it starts out with it just being like, they've got a trolley and some like cans and then got some tarps and they're like, all right. But you're like, damn, this is shit. And then, and then it just gets shitter and shitter and shitter. And it is like so harrowing and heartbreaking. You're like, it can't possibly get any worse. They've just been like starving, sitting in some woods for like a week and haven't had anything to eat. Oh no, it can get worse. Like it can always get worse. I mean, there are like little bits where it goes up, but really it just gets worse and worse. It's so bad. Yeah, I agree with you, Carl Holtz. It's so bad. You really feel the struggle. You, you just very much empathize with these characters. It's so painful. Um, but the way it's written, I really, I, when I first started, I was like, I don't think I'm gonna enjoy this. Um, but the way it's written, it's one of those things where it's like, there's no quotes, but there's quite a lot of talking, but it's just sort of plain. Um, and there's so much sort of like between the lines, especially because the only dialogue you really get is the man sort of talking to his son and his son asking questions and him trying to sort of play down any of the bad things and like remain a, a support for his son and like try and stay strong but also like he also is oh, it's, it's heartbreaking it's heartbreaking it's really good very dark if you want like an appreciation for like shelter and, and food and uh, like not apocalypse they would recommend <laughs> next we have another book that i do i did actually read the physical copy of and then quite funnily um it's my boyfriend's book club book for this month and i'd already like spoiled it for him completely which i feel a little bit guilty about but i did lend him my copy so anyway so we have the symbolic uh book stand there this is elephant oliphant is completely fine by gail honeyman i believe it won the cost of book prize last year something like that it's about a woman who is pretty socially inept um but doesn't really perceive herself as that she doesn't really like have any friends or contacts um all you know from near the start is that she has a really cruel mother who is just always putting her down over like their phone calls and stuff um and she's like a really abrasive narrator and she decides to like get a boyfriend or something like it doesn't even fucking matter uh i found the setting really boring i found the plot really boring um it's just like not it's not very interesting <laughs> When I read it, I was like, I'm like, I'm finding this okay. But now I just look back on it and I'm like, no, I didn't, I didn't feel like that book brought a lot to my life. I had some interesting chats about like loneliness um, from the perspective of someone that doesn't like realize that they're lonely, but then is starting to sort of appreciate. She like sees other people having human connections and then, and she's like, oh wow, like if only I could have that. And it's like just talk, make some friends. Anyway, I really, really hated the ending. I don't, yeah, I don't have much more to say about this. Like. Two out of five. And then we jump to the best book. This is A Little Life by Hanya Yanagihara. Hanya Yanagihara? Hanya Yanagihara. When I read this, I was like a zombie for the week. I was so absorbed in this book and it is so, it's so incredible. And um, last year, my flatmate read it and I remember her, the moment she finished it, she was like, I was in the kitchen, she was lying on the sofa. And she just sat down, she put on her chest and she just like cried a little bit. And I was like, you're right. And she was like, I just finished this book. And I'm like, what's it about? And she's like, it's about these four friends that like live in New York and like, but it's like so much more than that. <laughs> and that's pretty much my reaction when I finished it as well. Like, so it's about these four friends, um, Jude, Willem, JB and Malcolm. And they kind of met in college. Uh, it's mostly about Jude. Like mm, the book is about Jude. It's all about Willem. Um, and it kind of goes through until they're in their 50s. Um, so it's like their whole life. And um, Jude has had like a really awful childhood. Um, and it's like very awful. And it's only, it's very slowly explained. <laughs> and by the end you get the full picture. But um, 
it's just it's one of those things that his friends can't ask him about because he's really closed about um and it literally is like 30 years to sort of unravel that but also over those years you get them becoming professionals and getting jobs and you know girlfriends boyfriends married children whatever um and you see kind of like their connections grow but also so you see them grow as people but you also see like the things that they struggled with at the very start of the book are still like there by the end of the book and they're just mutated a bit. I didn't even write any notes for this book because how can I? It's so... It's so heartbreaking. Like it's extremely heartbreaking. It's like a bit heartwarming but it's mostly just heartbreaking. It's like an absolute trial. Um, but it's more, like a third of the way through I was like, oh, this is my new favourite book. How's it a third of the way through? It feels like it's about to end. Um, and then by the end I was like, oh this cannot be, I mean I can't call this my favourite book because it's just hurt me so much. <laughs> but it's incredible. Like if you ever feel like spending this much time on a book, um, I, I can't, I could, like, astonishing, devastating, extraordinary, a masterwork. I, I can't do any better than that review. It's just, I, I, yeah. <laughs> my camera is on low battery, we have two more books, I'm going to power through them. Okay, so next, they're both audiobooks. Um, Conspiracy, Peter Thiel. Hulk Hogan, Gorka, and the Anatomy of Intrigue by Ryan Holiday. Oh crap, I just realised I totally missed one because it was between some things. Jokes? Okay, so a while ago I, I reread um, The Obstacles Away by Ryan Holiday, uh, which is like, I re listened to it at the end of March. Um, I think I read it originally in October. I mentioned it in my last one, I will put it down. He is like the king of pop stoicism. Um, it really just like every, anytime I need to focus more, if I need to be in a focused mindset, I need to reread this book because it embodies all of the things that I want to be and how I want to think. Um, if you've never read a self help book before, even if you've read a bunch of self help books, like this is this is the one. This is the one I would recommend. Like it's so affecting. Anyway, so second last one, <laughs> Conspiracy, uh, which is a new book by Ryan Holiday. It came out in like February. It's very different to the rest of his books because it's him talking about this conspiracy that happened. Peter Thiel is one of the founders of PayPal. He's like a big VC like investor. Um, he owns this company called Panta. He's one of those like just billionaires, super, super powerful, rich people. Um, and this gossip blog called Gorka. So like, I don't remember any of the dates to do with this. Um, Gorka basically like outed Peter Thiel in like a very abrasive way. And Peter Thiel after that was like, Go on, Iron Gorka. And Gorka continued to do these sort of outlandish, horrible, just things that shouldn't exist. And Peter Thiel was like, I don't want this to exist. And uh, he was talking about it to, to some young guy one day. And he came back to him a couple weeks later. Like, they went out to dinner and he was like, I have a proposal. We can take down Gorka. It's just going to cost you like 10 million pounds, probably take about five years. And Peter Thiel's like, that looks through it and is like, yes, I would like you to do this for me. So they had this whole thing about. Um, finding basically like suing Gorka um, but trying to find the right stories that worked for it um, and eventually uh, Hulk Hogan's sex tape came out they released Hulk Hogan's sex tape so Hulk Hogan uh, was a like big wrestler back in the day and then he was on this reality tv show with his family uh, I don't know what it's called anyway he got a divorce and his best friend um, was like hey you should not feel so shit. How about you have sex with my wife? <laughs> so they have sex, but then his friend is like secretly filming it. Anyway, whatever, it gets out um, totally without his permission. He didn't even know who's being filmed. And they were like, this is the one, this is how we can take down Gorka. So Gorka are like, okay, Hulk Hogan's suing us. Like no one's ever really succeeded at suing us. Um, so let's just like keep going. And they basically make a lot of wrong decisions on this way, but they don't realize that Hulk Hogan has like a literal infinite, like infinite budget because Peter Thiel's behind it. So <laughs> Peter Thiel is like, take, oh, it's just, anyway, basically what happens eventually is that they win and like Gorka closes down. Uh, it, but it's also just like, should a billionaire be allowed to like destroy anything he wants? Um, in the case of Gorka, yes, but it's just, oh, it's just, it's a really, really fascinating look into everything that happened there. And also just like the, the fact that they like, actively created a conspiracy. Um, it was just oddly fascinating. I didn't think I cared that much, to be honest. I was just like, it's Ryan Holiday, I'm gonna like it, but I'm just blown away by this. <laughs> right, one more thing before everything just shuts off. Um, the Men Who Stare at Goats by John Ronson, 28. This is number 28. I finished it yesterday. Also, as an audiobook. Um, this is about 
some of the like weirder practices of the US military from like staring at goats until they die and like playing like the Barney theme song continuously to torture inmates at Guantanamo. Anyway, so it's uh, really, it's such a meandering, bizarre story. Um, you know, it's like MK Ultra and Heaven's Gate and everything in between. John Ronson as an investigative journalist, fantastic. I never read any of it, apart from the two that I just mentioned here. Before that, he did a series for Amazon. It was a podcast called The Butterfly Effect, which was about the porn industry. And I listened to that and it was like incredible. So I was like, this guy, he knows what he's doing. He's like a very, he seems like a very proactive journalist, but also really can weave stories together fantastically well. Um, and this was just like a bit of a romp. It was kind of just ridiculous. It's like, how could, how did any of this happen? And also crazy that like, not only did it happen, but we found out about like, eventually people knew about it. So what the hell have we not found out about? It was quite humorous and light and it was just very good. Highly recommend. Oh, oh my God, we've done it. And the battery on this hasn't died yet. I'm super impressed. Wow, kids. Um, I don't want to do this ever again. <laughs> I may, oh, it looks like I have no arms. It's weird. Um, I don't want to do this ever again. Maybe monthly, maybe I could do monthly reviews. Um, Cause I do love keeping this channel up, but at the moment I'm just too overwhelmed to really commit any time to it. Um, but yes, I hope you enjoyed whatever the fuck just happened. Um, all the links, all of the things down below. Follow me on Goodreads and on Twitter. Uh, buy my jewelry. I'm gonna stop now. Goodbye.